from the Squamish Chief. This is the Squamish Sound. I'm Keely Bartlett. And I'm Stephen Chua. This is the 25th episode of our weekly podcast. You'll hear the story behind the story as we take you into the newsroom. We'll talk about what did and didn't get into the newspaper this week. On the show today, we're covering a new candidate stepping into the ring with less than two months before the federal election. We hear about rental protections being enacted in some properties throughout Squamish, and our editor talks about the time Emily Carr spent in the sea to sky. Up first, Keely has been following the federal election for our paper. She has been keeping her eye out on all the candidates that have been coming out. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've recently, and I guess you could say finally, found out who the liberal candidate is for our writing. Uh, Keely, what's happening? So, as many people should know by this point, the federal election is coming up in late October, and there are just two months to go before we're able to cast our ballots and vote for who will next be in the federal government. Some parties in the Sea to Sky riding, sorry, I should say West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. Wow, that's a mouthful. It is. I'll forgive you to say Sea to Sky. That's all we really care about well, here. That's, that's <laughs> our section of the riding. So in our riding, there are parties that are still announcing their candidates. The most recent was last week. The Liberal Party finally announced that a man named Patrick Weiler and the NDP have yet to announce a candidate. But he dropped by the Squamish chief office this week to talk about his connections to the riding, why he's running, and what voters need to know about him. So currently, he actually lives in Vancouver, but he'll be in Ambleside during the campaign. So we asked him why he's running in a riding he doesn't live in. This this riding is my home. I, I was uh, born and raised in, in uh, West Vancouver. Um, went to, to elementary and high school in, in West Vancouver. My mother was a municipal councillor on the Sunshine Coast, so I spent a lot of my, every second weekend I would spend on the Sunshine Coast, and uh, my father was a president of a business based in Whistler, so for me, this, I'm quite familiar with the whole riding, it has each, you know, kind of from end to end, it has a special place in my heart, um, and I have a close connection to people throughout it. So the ability to be able to to represent them and uh, be able to listen to the concerns that they have and to be able to to um, have those um, be translated into policy and programs that help deliver for the community is uh, something that was very, very motivating for me. So he did say that if he is elected, he will be moving to the riding, most likely to West Vancouver. He said that it'll be an easier jumping off point for the traveling that MPs have to do quite a bit from here to Ottawa. And his father also still lives in West Vancouver, so he has that family connection as well. Mm -hmm. So while he doesn't have political experience, at least not yet, he did speak about how his background in environmental and indigenous law can translate into politics. Almost my whole career has been focused on bringing in effective public policy um, that addresses a lot of the issues that I think matter to this community, including with with, uh, better management of the environment, addressing climate change and uh, uh, working better, working in a, uh, developing a more improved relationship to work with Indigenous peoples um, and to, to improve the way we manage natural resources. So I think both, both with, I'm quite motivated to do whatever I can to work for this community and I think I have the tools to, to be able to do that. And we also asked why it took so long for the Liberals to name a candidate. Well, I can't, I can't speak to the processes that, um, that the other candidates went through with their parties. Um, I, I know that the, the process for the Liberal Party is, is quite rigorous. Um, the, to put together the application, is, it's quite comprehensive. Um, and there is a very thorough vetting process that, that, um, that uh, any uh, potential candidate needs to go through. And those processes take take quite a bit of time, uh, more time than than I would have liked, and I think that everybody would have liked. Um, uh, but uh, that's why we're all quite happy and excited that it's that it's wrapped up and it's official now. So this candidate will be in Squamish for a meet and greet on Monday, September 9th. He'll be at House Sound Brewing at 6:30 p.m.
we're going to be going on to the next topic, which is a recent zoning bylaw that has passed third reading in Squamish Council Chambers. So this is called the Residential Rental Tenure Zoning Bylaw. And what it does is it ensures that certain properties maintain the same amount of rental units in perpetuity. Basically, the background behind all this is there has been an ongoing housing shortage throughout the province of BC. And one of the big promises um, that the provincial government made and eventually put into place was giving local governments like municipalities such as our town the ability to write in bylaws and zoning that would protect the amount of rental stock in each either parcel of land, in a building. Um, you can go like from uh, fairly specific to um, I guess a little bit more general. So let, let's say you could put in a freeze if we want five units, or you could say X percent of units, so on and so forth. But the idea is rental stock is something that should be protected, like the rationale behind this whole law. And this would give municipal governments the authority to say, this is how much should be in each parcel of land. And the idea, or, or parcel of land or building. Um, and the idea behind that is, uh, we don't want gentrification just wiping out entire swaths of the area and forcing people to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a relatively recent and uh, newly granted power. It was just passed uh, provincially last year and only recently have municipalities such as ours tried to kind of put this into place. Mm -hmm. So for us, there were a number of properties around town. There were 12 properties. 309 units that this will be affecting mm -hmm. and to be very clear what it does is it's just saying in these areas where these rental units already exist we want them to keep existing right and i think yep. one thing that your article pointed out mm -hmm. was these units will keep existing even if that building is torn down and redeveloped the new building that replaces it has to have the same amount of units. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the idea. And in order to, I guess, uh, make sure there aren't so many workarounds, they've installed an average room size uh, stipulation. So um, foreseeably, if I was a really creative developer, I'd mm -hmm. be like, yes, I still have 22 units, mm -hmm. 22 units for ants, and they'd be <laughs> all like these tiny little things, mm -hmm. and you could technically um, it, like work around it like Just that. Just with really, really small dimensions. Exactly. So that's what that's what uh, counselors were afraid of, and they wanted to put that average room size clause in there, but uh, in order to, because they understand that this is not like a always the ideal way to develop a building. Mm -hmm. They say that developers can still make an application to... To have it a different amount. Exactly. Um, and I guess uh, there was a public hearing that um, occurred before third reading passed, and it was actually pretty sparse. There was only two people who spoke. Uh, mm -hmm. One person, her concern was more how the message was being relayed to the public. So it wasn't a, a hard opinion for or against that at least mm -hmm. what she spoke of and then there was a person uh, who identified himself as a property owner um, of the Westway Avenue apartments in Valleycliff mm -hmm. he is a, a Burnaby resident and he said that this would really um, this could potentially make a big impact on the values of the property and um, that is basically the unintended consequence that could happen. And it's been a thing that council has discussed mm -hmm. where they say we should be careful about how we use this power because if developers feel, um, let's say I have uh, kind of like an older building, we put in this bylaw um, and 22 rental units have to stay in there no matter mm -hmm. what. If I'm a, if I'm a, a developer and I see this old building. Mm -hmm. One option previously would be for me to just knock it down and build like a whole bunch of profitable condos. Mm -hmm. But now that I can't do that, if I knock it down, I have to build 22 rental units on top of 
and you know try to work those units into my my new development when they necessarily wouldn't have been that profitable mm -hmm. it kind of could decrease the incentive for me to renovate or change or enhance the property i might just be more inclined to just let it just fall into a Even dereliction if just the, the the idea that it would be less profitable. Exactly. So that's one thing where, where council uh, has discussed this and the, a point that this, um, this, per, this speaker at the public hearing was, I guess, sort of bringing up. His solution uh, was saying, hey, why don't you just give us more density to offset these extra rental uh, units that we're going to be expected to preserve? And uh, that is something that I think they're going to be thinking about in the longer term. But for now, that wasn't uh, um, necessarily part of this this um, this reading. And we'll see if that kind of makes itself in. But I think now what they're going to do is have a, a bit of a wait and see approach, mm -hmm. because this is a relatively new power. Only a handful of new municipalities have actually put it into practice and it hasn't been in practice for that long. So we don't have great numbers on how it would actually affect property value, if it would really create that backfire that people are fearing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it will be something definitely to watch and see if it does have the desired outcome. Okay, we bring it over here to our editor's pick, where we bring in our editor, Jennifer Thuncher. She's got quite the tale for us this time. Uh, can't wait to hear it. What's going on, Jen? <laughs> hey, how you doing? We're back. We're back We're after back. the summer break. Yes. yes. All right. So growing up like you, um, mm -hmm. I lived on the south coast of BC. And so we heard about Emily Carr ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. It was like I would, my eyes would roll back in my head if I heard about Emily Carr and those darn trees. So this week when I had an assignment to talk to the author, Lori Carter, about her talk at the Squamish Library about Emily Carr, I was thinking, okay, what's this going to be like? But it was so interesting, super mm. interesting. Okay, okay. Um, because I think the part that we don't get to hear is about the woman herself and what she was like. We see the paintings, which are iconic and wonderful, but not so much the stories of the things that Emily actually encountered in her time. So there's there's a lot more than what I'll talk about here. Um, you can go to the public library on October 3rd to hear Lori Carter speak about Emily Carr, but let's listen to one of the more interesting stories. And this happened after she had been in Brackendale for a time visiting her niece and her niece's family. And she had a lovely time in Squamish. Hmm. And then she got back on the train and headed up to Lillooet. And here's what was next. Okay. Hey, after she left them and she arrived in Lillooet, she had to have her dog put down. Oh. And uh, she had to she had to go and find. I mean, the story on this is that she she couldn't get the vet after she finally found a vet, and and she knew that this old dog just couldn't go on any longer. She couldn't let it suffer anymore. Um, uh, she she finally wound up going to finding the police constable, and getting him to shoot the dog for her. There was no other way she could get it humanely put down and then and then the police officer and she and a convict a guy who's in the jail overnight go across the fraser river and you know that dog coco is buried on the far side of the fraser river at lulut well that was uh, a very dramatic <laughs> right tale right um to be clear though it, it wasn't the convict who did it no. Right? No. The story is that okay. it was the police officer. And I'm not sure. We'll have to ask Lori. Maybe she knows when she's in town. But uh, why the convict had to come. I'm assuming you can't leave a convict overnight in a jail in Lillooet. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, or maybe they needed help from him. Who knows? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the mystery. But how often do you get a cop, a canine, a carter, and car? Oh, and a convict. All in one story. I don't think that's I don't, alliteration, I don't think, Stephen. I don't think the Carter was in that. Carter was the, the storyteller. Yeah, but she's in the story. That's okay. in the paper. All right. Okay. I, I hear you. <gasps> don't ruin my alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we prize our alliteration. Okay, that's it. Bye. Well, thanks, Jen. The Squamish Sound is brought to you by the Squamish Chief. The music for this episode was produced by Stephen Chua, cover photo by Clayton Matthews. Have a story tip? Give us a call at 604-892-9161. Send an email to news at squamishchief.com. You can read these stories and more online at squamishchief.com, the newspaper, and have the news delivered to your door every week.